Hey guys, it's Wolfie with an IE. So, you're probably wondering what a video on Appalachian history is doing on a channel with creepypasta, cooking, and video games. Uh, I'm glad you asked, because I honestly have no idea. I just like it. I mean, I've always been interested in Appalachian history, and it's interesting because a lot of people confuse Appalachia with the South, which always kind of bothered me because Appalachia has its own unique culture, history, and just all kinds of interesting things to talk about, and I think that's cool. Remember in the intro video when I said I like to make cool stuff? Well, this is some of that cool stuff. Anyway. Uh, welcome to the first episode of a little history series I'll be doing called That Dark and Bloody History Show. Now I'm going to explain why it's called that so you don't think I'm an edgy meme lord. Um, basically, there have been... this actually has to do with the state of Kentucky. And the reason I chose Kentucky is because it's one of the states that make up Appalachia. And because it has the coolest story I know of so far for why it's called what it's called. Now there have been a lot of different places and people and names and phrases that have been credited with the origin of the name Kentucky, but my, fa my ugh, excuse me, my favorite, and what I think is by far the coolest, is a man named John Filson, who is sometimes considered to be Kentucky's first historian. He was writing back in 1684, and he said that the Native Americans who lived in the area that became the state of Kentucky referred to it as that dark and bloody ground. Which, not only sounds totally metal, but it's also really appropriate because if there's anything that I love as much as I love history, it's spooky history. And Appalachia has a veritable ton of spooky history. So I'm going to go ahead and get into some of that here. Now, this video is probably going to be a little bit shorter than the rest of the videos are going to be because this is kind of an introduction where I'm basically setting up a format and uh, just getting into kind of general stuff and starting the show off. But basically, this show is going to be uploaded once a month in the full moon because I am a werewolf, obviously. Wink, wink. Anyway. So, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into things now. Now, um, the first thing you have to know about Appalachia is water. Yep, water. Everybody needs it. It sounds obvious, but we're all made of the stuff. I mean, we're basically jellyfish that got ideas. Let me go ahead and break it down to you. This is Bob. This is water. Bob has water, so he's happy. Now Bob has no water, so he's not happy. Okay, okay, that was a little patronizing. But I really can't overstate the importance of water to a civilization. In this case, we're talking about rivers. Now, there's lots of research out there about how pretty much every civilization was built on a big river. Ancient Egypt had the Nile, India the Ganges, there's the Tigris and the Euphrates in the Middle East, uh, China has the Yellow River and like three other really big rivers that sustain that country. Appalachia is no different, and it has the Ohio River. Now, although the Ohio River is named after the great state of Ohio, it actually crosses 15 states in its drainage basin and flows through or borders six. Those are Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Now, according to the Ohio River Foundation, it's the source of drinking water for more than 3 million people, and almost 10% of America's population lives within its basin. There's actually a really interesting article about the Ohio River on the History Channel's website, and I'm going to quote them a little bit here because they put this really well. So I'm going to start off, quote, The Ohio River is formed by the confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela Rivers at modern-day Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It ends approximately 900 miles downstream at Cairo, Illinois, where it flows into the Mississippi River. 
It reached, received its English name from the Iroquois word Owyo, which I'm probably mispronouncing, but it means the Great River. One of the first Europeans to see the Ohio River was a Frenchman, and I apologize if a French person ever hears this, and I'm totally mangling this name, but I'm going to give it my best shot. René Robert Cavalier Sieur de La Salle in 1669. He named the river La Belle Riviere, or the Beautiful River, which I think is pretty appropriate if you've ever seen the Ohio River. It's pretty awesome. Now, uh, that's end quote, by the way. That was my little bit there. Although, I'm sure the people at the History Channel probably also think it's awesome. Um, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and be linking in the description if you want to go check out this article because it's pretty interesting. Now, the river also served as the boundary between North and South during the Civil War, and during the 1800s it became a vital commercial route, with goods and people being shipped as far as New Orleans. The thing is, it was a lot cheaper to send stuff along the rocky Appalachian roads or, excuse me, to send it down the river than try to get these big, huge cargoes of stuff over and across mountains. That was a nightmare. So really, sending it down the river was like the only viable way for trading to really take off in Appalachia. And you'll find, and I'll talk about this in later videos, that a lot of Appalachian culture and economics developed because there were giant mountains in the way of everything. And they had to find basically creative ways to get goods in and out and to engage in trading. And the Ohio River was a big way of doing that. Although it wasn't the only way, and I'll get to that later in another video. Actually, even now, it's pretty much the go-to for shipping coal. And you wouldn't think about this because when you think of riverboats carrying goods to and fro different states or areas or things like that. Most people have a tendency to kind of think of that as, as purely historical, like something that used to happen but doesn't happen anymore. But that's actually not true in this case because it's still a lot cheaper to move coal along the river than it is along the roads. It uh, takes up less gas and you have more of a straight shot because even though the river kind of winds, it's not like you're going up and down hills. So it really helps out a lot. And if you ever cross or you're around the Ohio River at any point in one of the 15 different states that basically it takes up, then you'll see this back and forth all the time. It's boats carrying coal and uh, probably gas and some other things, places where they need to go. And I'd also like to throw in this. This is another little tidbit from the History Channel's website. Uh, there's another important thing to remember about the Ohio River is that in many treaties, the Ohio River was actually the dividing line between the British settlements in Kentucky and the Native American communities in the country that would become Ohio later on. So when you're reading historical accounts, of these conflicts basically around the time of the American Revolution and even up into and slightly after the American Revolution in the in the Appalachian area the conflicts between European settlers and the Native Americans it was right there on the Ohio River and so when you get into Appalachian history you're gonna be talking a lot about Native Americans and the battles between the Native Americans defending their land and the Europeans who wanted to settle in the area. And it actually gets really interesting. And I'm hoping that with this series, we're going to be able to dive into that just a little bit more. But anyway, I appreciate you guys listening to me ramble on and on about a river and about a stick figure. So it's been fun, and I hope to see you guys again. See you on the next full moon.